Uh, All right. Click your laptop. Sure. I'll give you this. Go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, good morning. Um, so I did Quran chapter 8, and it's called the Sports of War. If I have your hand out, the inner teacher, I will fill with my two guys and make sure you guys are actually paying attention. So the first point is chapter 8, got it right in the middle of it. Uh, I'm going to assume it's the one that's all worn out, that button. The right button. Yeah, there's no. I guess you use that. You use this one a couple times. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so what this chapter was about, it was kind of all about not so much like just what to do when you get spoils from war, but it was kind of like the people that are involved and like how you should view Allah as you do and how you should view the fellow people that you're either fighting against or the people that are next to you but like on your side. Um, so I picked out a few that like not necessarily spoke to me, but I thought I found interesting. Um, so the first one is chapter two and it's um, verse... Uh, yeah, chapter two. So, uh, chapter eight. It's verse two, not chapter two. Sorry. Um, and what it says is the believers are only those who, when Allah is mentioned, their hearts become fearful, and when His verses are recited to them, it increases them in faith, and upon their Lord they rely. I chose this one because I thought it was interesting that it says their hearts become fearful. Um, like for us as Christians, like when we think of God, I don't necessarily think the first thing that comes to our hearts is fear. It's kind of more love, compassion, faith. Um, so I thought it was interesting how like Muhammad says that like when they think of Allah, like the first thing they should be like is fearful of him because of what he can do to them, not necessarily like what he will do for them. Um, so did everyone get the two? It's verse two. Okay. The next one was um, verse seven, and then if you go on Quran.com, like it has these little uh, fill-ins, so, like it's a little easier to understand. So I'm going to read those too. It says, "Remember, O believers, when Allah promised you one of." one of the two groups, that it would be yours, and you wish that the unarmed one would be yours. But Allah intended to establish the truth by his words and to eliminate the disbelievers. Uh, I chose this one kind of just because of that last sentence. It says, but Allah intended to establish the truth by his words and to eliminate the unbelievers. Um, now, I guess this could be inter interpreted a couple different ways, like by the word eliminate. I guess you could say that it kind of means convert them, like make them understand like what you believe in make them become like one with you and like your beliefs and not as, I guess your tribe. Um, or it could mean physically eliminate, get rid of them, kill them. So I guess depending on how you interpret it, I guess that's kind of, some people might take this first and say like, oh, Muslims are violent, they're trying to eliminate anyone who doesn't believe in them. But I mean, I guess it's really the interpretation how you want to take it. Um, I think it's a, not questionable, but since it is open to interpretation, it can be used the wrong way and like justify wrong action, so it might be a little dangerous. Um, did everyone get that at seven? Cool. The next one I did, it's 15 and 16, and it says, O oh, you who have believed, when you meet those who disbelieve advancing for battle, do not turn to them with acts of your flight, and whoever turns his back to them on such a day, unless swerving as in strategy for war or joining another company, certainly returned with anger upon him from Allah and his refuge in hell, and wretched is the destination. Um, I kind of chose this for a couple of reasons. Um, one of them was kind of this last part where it says, like, if you do this, like, Allah, like, their God, like, he's going to be mad at you. Um, like, I kind of thought it was interesting how, like, throughout the chapter it says it a couple times, but um, um, Muslims, like, they're very... I guess okay with the understanding, like, if they mess up to a degree, like, Allah's going to be mad at them, like, he will kind of take out his wrath upon you, so, in a way, it's kind of scaring them into believing, but, like, I don't think that, like, they get scared by it, they kind of get motivated, like, they don't want to make, like, they want, they want to please Allah, like, then they'll get their blessings, so, like, I don't think they're afraid, I think they're more motivated, and then, I chose this middle, I like the, I didn't like the middle part, I thought the middle part was interesting, how it talks about, like, don't abandon the people next to you, like fight for the people next to you, like don't turn your back like, unless you're using it as a strategy. And then everyone get 15 and 16. Okay. The next one was verses 26 and 27. And then it says, And remember when you were few and oppressed in the land, fearing that people might abduct you, but he sheltered you, supported you with his victory, and provided you with good drink, that you might be grateful. Oh, you who have believed. Do not betray Allah and the messenger or betray your trust while you know the consequence. Um, again, the, when it says the consequence, it's talking about like, 
making Allah angry, and then like as a result, like they'll be cast into hell. Or, do they believe like is that what their name is for? It's hell. Yes. It's like would be cast into hell. And then I chose this one because um, I can see like how they like, use it as like like throughout the entire chapter, like well, there were sections where it's kind of like okay, like I can kind of like get behind this. Like I see like why they were so motivated to like go fight. And like if you watch the video from our video assignment. Their first battle, like they were outnumbered like 300 to 1,000. Like they kind of went in there, like they were ready to go, they were ready to fight, weren't scared. And, like I could see, like from these sections, like I could see why. Like it's kind of like, okay, like we could do this, doesn't matter like, how few there are, but like Allah is behind us, like we can do this. Um, so I chose that because, like, it's very motivational. It's, like I could see why they believed what they believed from so strongly. Uh, the next one is verse 41. Anything you obtain of war booty, then indeed for Allah is one fifth of it, and for the messenger and for his near relatives and the orphans and the needy and the stranded traveler. If you have believed in Allah and that which we sent down to our servant, bless you, bless you, we sent down to our servant on the day of creation. Criterion. Criterion. The day when the two armies met. And Allah over all things is competent. Um, the first reason I chose this one because it says, then indeed for Allah is one fifth. And like as Christians, like we tie ten percent. So like I guess Muslims, like they call it if they call it tie, they do twenty percent. So I found that interesting because that's that's kind of a big chunk of what you get. Um, and like it may be different. Like that might just be like for what they get for more, or it may be all income. Mm -hmm. um, and then I mean I like the things that it said about like. Who they give the money to so like it's not just like they're giving it to god it says like it's very specific like it's the needy the stranded traveler the orphans um we talked about it in class but it looks like there's a big emphasis 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 on giving to orphans and widows like i think that's a very like in the bible it says like that that group will always be there and will always be in need it probably says somewhere in the quran too so i guess that is a good group like they are giving that one fifth to people who do need it did everyone get 41 that last one? This one's verse 47. And it says, And do not be like those who came forth from their homes insolently, and to be seen by people and avert them from the way of Allah. And Allah is encompassing of what they do. I, I chose this one because I thought it was interesting how it says that, like, if people don't believe, it says kind of, like, if you look at the word avert, it says kind of like keep them away. So it's kind of like if they don't believe in Allah, like the Muslim faith, it's kind of like, keep them away. Like, in my mind, it says, like, don't really try to convert them, but kind of, like, maybe it eliminate them, or, like, get them away from you, or get or them out of the land. What? Or isolate them. Or isolate them, yeah. So, wait, assimilate or I, I isolate. Sorry about that. So, yeah, isolate. Or, like, so ostracize. I mean, yeah, so, like, it can be, I think, I think this can be taken a few ways. Like, it could be ostracized, it could be eliminated, it could be isolate them away from your people and your faith, so... It's one another one of those where like it could be interpreted differently. Like it could be used as an excuse to do something that isn't necessarily a good thing. And then the next one is verse sixty-five, and it says, "O prophet, urge the believers to battle. If there are among you twenty who are steadfast, they will overcome two hundred. And if there are among you among you one hundred who are steadfast, they will overcome a thousand of those who have disbelief because they are people who do not understand." And this is another one that like I just thought was like I can see like why people got behind it because like if this is Muhammad saying it like they believe that Muhammad's words are, like words directly from God like God saying like you could do all things that like if you have that faith in me so like going back to like the video that you watched whenever you watched it like that three hundred to a thousand you could understand like why they went into those battles like yeah we can do this doesn't matter how many people there are going against us like we can do this as believers because Allah is behind us so that was verse sixty five. And then, this is verse 69, and said, So consume what you have taken of war booty as being lawful and good, and fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. So, I chose this one for a few reasons, too. Um, so, like, the first part, it says, like, it is okay, like, you went to war, you won this battle, like, you can get the goods, like, you can benefit from it, other than just, like, getting the new land, and getting the power. Like, you can take from those people, like, let it be yours to give that one fifth. Also, 
again, it's mentioned like fear Allah, like have that fear in your heart that like if Allah wants to, like you don't do right in his eyes, like he can pretty much smite you, like he will send you to hell, like it's not gonna be a fun place. And then also I chose this because in chapter eight there were seventy five verses. And this is the first time that's mentioned that Allah is forgiving and merciful. So I, I kind of found that interesting because, like, if you go throughout the Bible, especially like the New Testament, like, the fact that God is forgiving and Jesus is forgiving is kind of all throughout. And, like, it's kind of something, like, Christians kind of, like, build their entire belief on. It's like, oh, if you mess up, like, you can be forgiven. But, like, from my, like, in my opinion, like, from the Quran, it's kind of, like, don't necessarily rely on that aspect of it. But, like, Allah is forgiving, like, if you do truly repent. And that was all of chapter 8. Alright, we got questions. questions. This was the last one. What was the verse before that? This was 69? 65. Oh. What was the one before that? 47. Oh. Is that all? Is that all? Got a question right there. Yes. I mean, I can go Oh. <laughs> It's better to ask him. No, go ahead. Oh, you want to go next? Yeah. Okay. No problem. Let me just say a couple things while you, you can hand that out, and I will try to pull yours up here. Notice in verse 41, it talks about providing for orphans and widows. And remember we said that... Um, he said that um, this was Muhammad's experience, right? He had been, let's see, where are yours? He had been, um, here it is. He had been an orphan. So I think he had a special affinity for, uh, for that idea. So do you think that's his own idea, or he just put a lot of that? Well, you know, it's hard to say, right? But uh, certainly I think his experience would reflect that uh, same idea. All right, next up is Connor and uh, the table. I chose uh, chapter 5, uh, Almeida, the table. It's uh, the fifth chapter of the Quran with 120 verses. It describes dietary laws, foods that are forbidden and permitted to Muslims for consumption. There's some uh, Arab food, such as kibbe and such. Ooh, kibbe. That's good stuff. It is. Very good, yeah. It's meat, it's meat, ground meat inside of uh, bread. Uh, verse, uh, verse 1. Believers, honor your bonds. All grazing beasts of the flock are permitted to you except those which are you are not allowed to hunt in the state of Ihram, a state of pilgrim sanctity. Indeed, Allah decrees as he wills. Essentially, this means that uh, goats, cows, uh, sheep, and camels are permitted for consumption. Here is the nice hand. So they can eat the camel. Yes. Uh, verse 3, uh, forbidden to you are carrion, blood, the flesh of swine, this animal slaughtered in any name other than Allah's. The animal which has either been strangled, killed by blows, has died of a fall, by goring, or that devoured by beasts of prey, unless it be that which you yourselves might have slaughtered while it was still alive, and that which was slaughtered at the altars. So these are foods that are forbidden. Little piggies. Poor piggies. They're not welcome. Sad. And what about that? Is that, that is a, a kangaroo? Can't eat kangaroo. That's a, that's a dead uh, deer. <laughs> But you can eat a deer, but just not if it's already dead. Yeah. Oh, deer. Well, that's, that's a good rule to go by. So. you got to kill it yourself. That's why I think roadkill is fine. Okay, go ahead. As long as you're the one that did it. Verse 5-4. They ask you what has been made lawful to them. Say all clean things that have been made lawful to you and such hunting animals as you teach. Training them to hunt, teaching them the knowledge Allah has given you. You may eat what they catch for you. But invoke the name of Allah on it. Have fear of Allah in violating his law. Allah is, Allah is swift in his reckoning. So essentially this means if you train a falcon or a cheetah to hunt for you, and it brings you back a rabbit, that is uh, fine. You can eat that. You're going to train a cheetah? I, mean, they, they, I looked it up and they said they used hunting cheetahs. It's... Hunting cheetah? Wow, that's awesome. Wow. Yeah, now, uh, definitely uh, falcons are very popular. I've never met a hunting cheetah. 
but I don't, I don't uh, doubt you. I don't think you want to meet one. Yeah. <laughs> I have been in the same room with a cheetah. Did you touch it? I did not touch it. Were you allowed to touch it? Uh, it was not recommended. Uh, verse 5-5, five, five, this day all good things have been made lawful to you. The food of the people of the book is permitted to you, and your food is permitted to them. Uh, this means... Uh, Food prepared by practicing Christians and Jews is permitted to Muslims and vice versa. Hmm. Well, you know, especially the many of the Jewish laws, kosher laws, are similar, are, are similar aren't they? Uh, no swine and no pork. Yeah. And, and also shellfish, stuff like that. Uh, that seafood is permitted for... Okay. Seafood? Well, I don't think they can eat shellfish, Muslims. Or Jews. Well, some Jews. Some Jews eat whatever they want. Um, Ooh! Allow preparation involves the killing through a cut to the jugular, jugular vein, the carotid artery, and the windpipe. Animals must be alive and healthy at the time of the slaughter, and all blood is drained from the carcass. During the process, a Muslim was to recite a dedication. Here's a... Tell us which or shahada. Uh, other haram foods are forbidden. Donkey meat, predator animals possessing fangs, such as a cat, a dog, or a lion. Uh, birds that possess talons, such as an owl. Owl, lizards, snakes, scorpions, and mice. Donkey meat? I wonder if donkeys are tasty. <laughs> uh, the reasons for these dietary outlaws have been <coughs> speculated. Uh, one could be health. Obviously, eating carrion would not be very good for you. If you find something uh, dead on the road, you should not eat that, so that is a good rule. You've never lived in Kentucky, I can tell. Uh, pork, some scholars argue that pigs are prescribed due to their costly upbringing, uh, also as a means of keeping the body healthy. Early scholars argued that the meat of some animals, such as birds and fish and pigs, were indigestible, and the pigs also considered filthy animals, believed at the time that if swine were used for food, marketplaces, and even houses would be much dirtier. And also there's an economic uh, aspect to it as well. Uh, Muslims can only buy meat that is halal. So uh, essentially that's meat from a Muslim butcher, thus keeping a Muslim business employed in the community. It's likely another reason. A significance for Muslims, observant Muslims only eat allowed uh, animals prepared in an allowed manner, and that uh, means that um, increasing numbers of supermarkets uh, have like a little skirt, like, like, a, like a simple, like, a, simple as a, like for kosher, it's also now not allowed. So let me ask you this: What what differences do you see between this and like Jewish kosher laws? Do you find any differences? Ah, uh, uh, just the, just the similarity of uh, swine and uh, shellfish and such. Okay. Anybody have any questions for him? And that was the chapter on the table, right? Yep. The table. Yeah, this is interesting. You got some good pictures there. I like that. I'll have to tell you that I um, spent many years in Jordan, and the people there um, are quite particular about the meat that they eat. They will eat goats, by the way, and sheep. Those are kind of expensive meat. Uh, camel. Very expensive, not eaten very often. Uh, chicken, chickens are, are eaten quite frequently. In fact, they've been trying to get people to buy as we buy our chicken. You know, say already dead in a package, maybe in a bag, a whole chicken, or chicken parts, parts is parts. Um, has not gone over well in Jordan. And I don't, I'd imagine not. Because they, like, like it says here, you want to make sure it's alive, it's killed in the proper way. Even if they're assured of that, sometimes they're not well, sure. One thing that's a change in modern times is they've started uh, stunning the animals into unconsciousness before they uh -huh. uh, cut the throat, so it's more humane. Oh, yeah, we, we don't want that. Yeah. I mean, uh, yes. Well, I can tell you what happens when, when a guy wants a chicken. Because uh, 
you know, we would ride, they had, they had a very small, I guess I'll call it a bus, but it's really like a van with bus-like seats on it. And uh, those are very common in Jordan as a way to get around. And, and so they have a particular route that they go, but uh, the, the locals will get the bus driver to stop um, like at the chicken shop. And you'll know it's a chicken shop because you'll see the chicken boxes out front. They have big uh, rectangular boxes. I'd say they're probably about a meter long, half meter wide, about a half meter high. Okay, so about three feet by one and a half, two feet by one and a half, two feet. They stack those up out in front of the shop. That lets you know this is a chicken shop. And um, the guy will ask the bus driver to stop, and he's going in to get a chicken. Now, when you go in to get the chicken, all the chickens are in those boxes, and the boxes are stacked in that store in the front. And you go in and look your chicken in the eye and pick the one you want. The chickens are alive, in other words. Then the chicken man, as I'll call him, uh, will dispatch your chicken. That's the way the British would put it, dispatch. And the chicken is dispatched, cleaned, defeathered, and put into you know, a, a plastic bag, basically, all in I don't know, two minutes. From the time the guy gets off the bus, the time the guy gets back on the bus, two or three minutes. He picks the chicken, the chicken is prepared, he gets back on the bus, we take off. Because what I remember the first time we stopped there, I man, we're gonna be here for a while. You know, the guy's got to do all this to the chicken. No. Nope. Did not take him long at all. This guy's a trained professional. So he had his chicken. And he gets on the bus and he goes on home, and then I'm sure he gives the chicken to his wife, perhaps, and she cooks it up or whatever. In other words, it goes from being a live chicken that this guy looked at to this guy eating it in probably an hour or two. Now, of course, that's the way it used to work on my grandmother's farm. I don't know if you had a grandmother who had a farm who had chickens running around on it, but I did. And the chickens were running around. I mean, they, you know, I guess they call it today free range. We didn't have fancy words for it. We just said the chickens are out there running around. You got to go get one. Now at night, of course, you had to put the chickens in. You don't want the chickens free range at night. You won't have any chickens left. Chickens want to go in the coop at night. Anyway, so the chicken would be out there, and uh, I would go out helping. I didn't help a lot. I was pretty young, but I have to grab the chicken, dispatch the chicken. I won't describe that and then, uh, you know, clean it, to clean it, defeather it, put it in hot water. It makes the feathers release. That's how you, scalding water, yes. Yeah, she's looking at me strange. That's how you get the feathers out. You can pluck them out otherwise, but it's not gonna have a good, not gonna be easy. So you put them in the hot water, blanch them, as they call it, or uh, kind of scald them, then you pull the feathers out pretty easily. Then you take chicken inside, my grandmother would fry it up. Now, I'll tell you when the chickens got nervous. When they saw a car pulling up to the house they had not seen before, they got real nervous because they knew one of them was going down. And uh, so the chickens would start to scatter once they figured out what was up. <laughs> so that's chicken. that's chicken news for today. There's more to it, but that's plenty. Uh, yeah, that's good. It's very good. And there are a lot of connections between, um, between the two. And of course, a lot of this, I think you're right, is health reasons. If, if you find a dead animal somewhere, you don't know how it died. You don't know if it was sick when it died. You don't know what's happened to it since it died, right? And of course, it doesn't take too long. And insects and other things start to eat it, birds and other things. So yeah, you got to make it pretty quick. So like I was saying, you know, in Kentucky, I'm not, not really joking about this. If you hit a deer on the road, or as I said, the deer hit me, which really it did. 
Oh, dear. Uh, it wouldn't be carry on that. It would be killed by blunt force, which is also uh, a rock. Which is also a rock, yeah. Well, no, I didn't kill it with blunt force. It committed suicide. I think a suicidal deer is allowable to eat. Anyway, you are allowed in, uh, in Kentucky anyway, I don't know about here in beautiful Florida, that if the deer hits your car in whatever procedure that is, you can then take the deer with you and uh, butcher it and eat it. And you don't need a license and you don't need, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, I have had a deer hit me. I did not pick it up. People said, did you pick it up? I said, no, I didn't. Because, you know, I didn't really have a, a, you know, a place to take care of the deer. And then once I would get it all taken care of, I didn't have any place to, like, freeze it all. You know, it's a lot of deer meat. But uh, I could have given it to somebody, I'm sure. They would have been happy to have it. Because a lot of people do eat venison. Um, back where I lived in Kentucky, that was pretty common. All right, very good. Who wants to be next? Does it want to be Chuck, a.k.a. Chad? I'll go, yeah. All right, that's what I thought. I knew you liked it. i got to find your... Uh... Is this it? Yeah, there's a file. Is that it? Yes, there's a file. Get the one from like two or three minutes ago. Two or three minutes ago. About five minutes ago. Ten sixteen. Yeah. yeah, that should be it. Okay. I can't keep up with all these different versions. Does that look right? Yep. All right. Our next presentation is by Chad, a.k.a. Chuck. Oh, yours is wider, so I'll have to put it in the middle here. I can't. It'll be all right. Okay. Repentance. What's your chapter number? I don't know. I don't remember. What? Is that a deal breaker? Or it's not a deal breaker. I just... I have to we'll figure it out. I have the section on repentance. So... Repentance. Okay. Alright, some common themes are, uh, first of all, the, the polytheists, I guess you could call them uh, Christians. They believe in, like, the Trinity, which is counter to what the Muslims believe, which is Allah is the only God, and he's the only person to be worshipped. They believe, in verse 5 it says, and capture, kill, and ambush them wherever you find them. So that could apply to any religion that believes in more than one God, which Christians include. Uh, if you repent, pray, and pay the alms, all is merciful and forgive them. Verse 5. Uh, don't ally yourself with parents or siblings who disbelieve. You are a wrongdoer if you do. Uh, I'm going to try to go more quickly because I have a lot, a lot of information, but basically the gist is fight those and mobilize and the cause of all for those that don't believe, basically. And uh, kind of the same belief about hell, you know, hell is going to quote unquote engulf the, engulf the disbelievers. So uh, the, the good verses in verses 1 through 25 are the polytheists traded away all his revelations for a cheap price. Those who believe and strive in all his paths with their, passion, with their person and possessions are of a higher rank with Allah. So it's kind of like a differing uh, nature in terms of God that if you strive and you are basically put more of your life into what Allah wants you to do, he, you're a, of a higher rank with him. So he will value who you are more, I guess. You have to work for your value for Allah. But the Christian God values you for, for who you are. And you don't have to work for that. Uh, verses 25 through 50, another. Verse 29, five, those who don't believe in all are the last day, nor abide by the religion of truth willingly or unwillingly. And uh, in verse 30, it says, the Jews said Ezra is the son of Allah, and the Christians said the Messiah is the son of Allah. And they basically say that they're very deceived and that may Allah assail them. This is chapter 9. So chapter 9. nine. And in verse 31, it continues saying, They worship the Messiah, the son of Mary, instead of the one God, and there's no God except He, which is Allah. And 
uh, demonstration in terms of mobilization in verses 38, 39, and in 36, where it's, it commands them to fight the polytheists collectively and to mobilize in that cause to do that. Verses 50 through 75, uh, oh, those who insult the messenger of Allah will have a painful pen penalty, and uh, we punish part of somebody, but we punish others because they are guilty, and that refers to, to hypocrites, which is uh, not good things will happen to them in verse 68, because Allah promises that the hypocrite man and hypocrite woman and all the disbelievers will go to the fire of hell. <clears throat> He's cursing and it's their due. I'm not going to get into everything because you have the verses on your paper where you can see. Uh, so you can read that. Verses 75 through 100, those who criticize the believers who give char charity voluntarily and ridicule those who find nothing to give but their own effort or receive a painful punishment. Uh, basically talking about uh, charity is big in the Muslim faith. You need to, to pay your alms and to, to help the, the downtrodden. And that's always been valued in Muslim society. And uh, they say that if you criticize those who give charity voluntarily, it won't be good for you. And I thought verse 80 was particularly interesting to this thing. It kind of reminds me of the Christian verse when Peter says like, Oh, how many times are we supposed to give? And he says, like, 70 times 7, which is basically no limit. But it says here that if you ask for forgiveness for them, even if you ask for forgiveness for them 70 times, Allah will not forgive them. So that I, I find that to be a... I, it reminded me of that verse, and there's a, a stark difference in terms of that. And another verse about hypocrites, in verse 85, Don't let their possessions and children impress you. All it desires to torment them in this world and the next, which is pretty uh, strong language. <laughs> uh, another verse about hypocrisy. He says that the Quran says that the desert Arabs are the most steeped in disbelief and hypocrisy, which they were in the region at the time. Uh, the desert Arabs were the most hip hypocrites, if that's the word. When I talk about desert Arabs, I also talk about like the ones that were like polytheists, I believe many gods, like in the and the uh, thing that the film that showed you? Probably, because uh, polytheists are mentioned several times throughout this chapter. It's always been a common motif. Uh, so it probably includes all of that. You know, desert Arabs are hypocrites that don't follow the faith that are polytheists in nature, which could include Christians. So, Verses 100 to 129, uh, it says in verse 100 that the, the people that first followed Muhammad are they're called the pioneers or the first migrants in support of Islam are much loved by Allah. And they all is pre prepared for them gardens below which rivers flow and they, they will abide there forever, which is basically heaven and it's a great reward for them. Uh, verse 101, it talks about uh, others have confessed their sins, have missed good deeds with bad deeds. And a key word is perhaps Allah will redeem them. Allah is forgiving and merciful. I think that's kind of another, another difference between, you know, Christianity and Islam. It says, you know, perhaps Allah will forgive them. But he is forgiving and merciful, but I think only if you follow, like, the path and you, you do what it takes, required to earn Allah's approval. And it says, uh, some are held in suspense awaiting Allah's decree as to whether Allah will forgive them or not, which kind of backs up my assertion there in verse 106. And uh, another difference is, it is not becoming of the followers to ask forgiveness for the polytheists as after it has become clear they are bound for hellfire. So, uh, you know, Jesus commands us to pray for our enemies and to pray for those that don't believe. Even if, you know, they're completely against what we believe, we still need to pray for them. But uh, verse 113 here says that if, if it has become clear they're not going to change, you know, don't ask for forgiveness, don't worry about them, don't pray for them. So uh, that's another big difference. In verse 123, another command to fight those of the disbelievers who attack you, let them find severity in you, which speaks for itself, find severity. Uh, yeah, I went all the way up to verse one, one, 129 is the last verse, so one, verse 123 is uh, the last thing that I found worth mentioning. Uh, significance for Muslims, we kind of uh, went over this, don't associate with unbelievers or hypocrites. Even if that includes your own family, which is a strong teaching. Allah is a vengeful God where you have to earn his approval to earn his respect. You have to work for it. It's kind of like the punisher. Yeah, he's a, 
You have to, to work for his love, basically. Uh, works are required to gain all his approval. Strive against the unbelievers, mobilize against them, which could be up for debate what mobilize means. But there's a lot of different interpretations of that verse, and that's where you get into what the Quran actually means today. Like, what does mobilize mean? You know. In Christianity, you know, other polytheist religions are a farce, obviously. And uh, fight the polytheists collectively as they fight you collectively, which is a quote from the Quran. And like I said, all of Allah is even more of his commandments. So, that's it. Do you have questions? Do you know if they have, like, They they uh, they respect Jesus. They think that he was a, a prophet, but they don't believe that he was God. They he Jesus is mentioned in their uh, in the Quran in a favorable light at a few points. So they, they they think favorably of him, but they don't believe that he was God. They they believe that the whole concept of the Trinity is uh, basically heresy. Cause they're they're monotheistic and they believe Allah is the only God. Yeah, one one of the things that you did point up here that definitely is um, a major point, and that's the idea that um, of monotheism. That is the key teaching, uh, the first teaching, I guess, the shahada, that there is no God but God, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. And so when, at least Muslims I have spoken to in the past, some of them, will ask me if I believe in God. And I say, yes, I believe in God. And then they'll say, uh, do you believe, you know, in Jesus as God? And I say, yes, I believe that Jesus is God. Then they said, do you believe in two gods? Yeah. You believe in two gods. And so I don't bring up the Holy Spirit at that point. But <laughs> the, the idea of the Trinity is going to be, you know, if you're ever going to try to communicate with a Muslim about your faith, that's going to be one of the first first places it's going to go, I can tell you. Plus another thing is, you know, a lot of like the harsh rhetoric about fighting the unbelievers and stuff and stuff like that, that's where you get to the whole debate about like, kind of like with the Bible, like, oh, is this meant like for our time or is it is it meant for, uh -huh. for what they were doing back then? Like, should we carry that into... You know the contemporary era, like what, like what does it mean? You know, and uh, right, and the, the Muslims that are actually following what their book tells them to do, they're they're interpreting it quite literally to where they're it says to fight the unbelievers. So that's what they're doing, but the Muslims that don't do that believe that is not applicable for today's time. Yeah, part of it is um, not not always that it's not applicable for today. But part of it's how, in other words, you have the word, like you have up there, strife. Yeah. Or strive. Um, you should strive against the polytheists. Uh, the, the question then comes, uh, f for some, for example, the word jihad means to strive. And the word jihad can have different uh, meanings or different connotations. Yeah. It's a struggle. The word jihad really means struggle. So if you're going to struggle against the polytheists, you're going to struggle against what is bad, or what's wrong, in their opinion, how does that, how does that struggle play out? For, for many of them, you should be struggling. All Muslims should be struggling. They should be struggling um, all the time. But it doesn't necessarily mean against a person. A lot of times the struggle is internal. You struggle against yourself. You're supposed to submit, that's another big word of submission, you sort of submit yourself to God, to Allah, and that submission is not going to be easy. And of course, I think part, part of what they're talking about here with the polytheists is that uh, the polytheists, I mean, yeah, one verse came to my mind when it said, well, you should just give up on those polytheists. Yeah. 
I thought about where it was said, if you go and preach and they won't accept your message, you should take the dust off of your shoes, you know, and leave them and move on to another place. Yeah. Another, you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but you get the idea. In other words, the idea is, is that if you just spend all your time with those who won't accept, they're not going to accept it, you're better off to move to others who might. Yeah. But yes, you're right. These, these are and have been interpreted in different ways. And so this is part of the... This um, is the debate that's going on today. Well, it's a debate, and it's also, you know, real differences in interpretation. I think the majority of, of Muslims, at least that I have met, are not... Uh, violent. That's, yeah, the, the vast majority are not violent. And they're not, while they would say, yes, you know, they, they don't agree with Christianity, obviously. Uh, they don't, you know, they believe Jesus is a great prophet, but they're not, at least the ones I've met, they're not wanting to kill you if you don't agree with them. Um, now, some of them do take it this way, obviously. Um, but I think that's, you know, whatever you want to label them as, I think one thing would be clear is that's a minority. It's not a majority. But, you know, those numbers do change. And as people get frustrated, um, especially it seems younger people, as they get frustrated and they see they don't really have any options and they try to figure out why, a lot of them are turning to violence, you know, a lot of times what I see with, um, with some of these groups within Islam that are violent, I, it, to me, I think there's a lot of parallels with, um, in the United States with gangs. There are people looking for uh, a community, they're looking for acceptance, uh, and they're wanting to lash out against uh, whatever it is is bad in their life, and they want someone to blame for that. And so here I can be in this group, and this group gives me meaning, gives me purpose, gives me a sense of duty. And so I think you find a lot of, I think, you know, I don't know if anybody has ever, probably somebody has, if not, they'll steal my idea now, right? But no, I mean, you really should compare the two. The kind of people who are drawn to gangs, violent gangs, say in the United States or anywhere, are the same kind of population, for the most part, who are drawn to uh, violent groups within Islam. Uh, I think that's true. Well, anything else this morning? We'll meet again on Wednesday. We're pretty much out of time, so we'll see you then.